everyone. Welcome to Family Talks. My name is Asia McCoy and I'm a family recruiter for Children's Home Society. Tonight, we're going to be having a conversation with one of our CHS families about their journey to bring children to a permanent, safe, and loving family. Now, not only um, are we going to be having a conversation today, but also you are also invited into our conversation. We have recruiters that are answering your questions live in the chat. So make sure that any foster care, any adoption questions, any questions that you have about our agency, make sure to comment below or to the sidebar, wherever it is. <laughs> did you guys did you guys know that there are over 12,000 children right now that are in the North Carolina foster care system? And out of that 12,000, nearly 2,400 children right now are waiting for an adoptive home. So that means nearly 24 children are waiting for that place to call home, that place of that foundation of love, safety, and care. And so today we're going to talk with a man who has previously adopted and given two children um, that place to call home and is currently working toward adopting another child and giving them a, a loving home as well. Um, everyone, please meet Philip Brooks. All right, so um, let's start from the beginning of your story. Um, what inspired or led you to pursue adoption? Wow. Um, the main thing that drove me to pursue adoption was I had always wanted to be a dad and I would be out in the streets. I'd be out in the mall. I'd be at the supermarket and I would see men with their kids, especially with their sons. And there was always this desire in me, man, I want to be I want to be a dad one day. Um, I spent 20 plus years as a youth pastor in, in different states. And so I was always building relationships with kids and I spent a lot of years mentoring and encouraging and, and, and pouring into them. And the challenge for me was these kids, they, they were only in my life for a season. They come and I pour into them and then they would be gone. And I wanted kids that want to be a permanent part of my life. And so that was the primary thing that drove me to considering adoption. Um, the other thing was that my mom uh, spent years fostering and eventually adopting three of the kids that she fostered. And that was a big inspiration to me. That was, okay, if mom can do it, um, then I can do it. And so between those two factors, that's what drove me to the point of deciding I was going to adopt. You decided that, you know, adopting is something that you want to do because you have that desire to be a dad. Um, how did you, I guess, initially feel um, getting started with the process? Like, did you find it overwhelming or how did you feel? Uh, Overwhelming is probably an understatement, probably because of the the uh, the training, which goes on for you know several weeks, almost three months worth of training, uh, two three hours a, a shot, um, and then the paperwork. Uh, the paperwork is is overwhelming, um, and, and and I say overwhelming with with a caveat because when you're really motivated to do something and it, when it's a genuine desire, you 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 know those those things become minor inconveniences. Yes, you know, the training three hours a night for, for six, eight, 20, 10, 12 weeks, whatever it is. And then the amount of paperwork, they become necessary evils to the ultimate goal. And so while they were, you know, they were challenging from the standpoint of, oh my God, another, another class and oh my God, all this paperwork. Um, you you knew what the end result was going to be. And so you, you know, you kind of figured, okay, these are really just minor inconveniences. They're big deals, but they're minor inconveniences when you compare them to the permanency that you're giving the child. So that's how yeah, I feel. Def yeah, definitely. Um, you know, you're, you're doing all this paperwork, but at the end of the day, just like you said, you know, you're giving that child an opportunity to have a permanent family and, you know, yeah, that, that outweighs the challenges. Um, well, just, just kind of speaking of, you know, different challenges that you encountered along the way, um, what, what sort of challenges, you know, did you face during this journey to adopt? The, the biggest challenge on the journey to adoption was um, number one, making sure that I had a support system. Um, all of my biological family, and, as well as my adopted brothers, they're all in New York. And I haven't lived in New York in whew, well over 25 years. Um, and so all of my family was gone. And so I had to make sure that I had a support system um, that would be present to help me in, in, in raising my, my sons. Um, and that took some work that 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 meant uh, reaching out and building relationship with neighbors. It meant tapping into the, the resources at my church. Um, and it also meant tapping into whatever resources the adoption agency was providing uh, to help along 
um, especially after the placement, because there's always going to be a need for resources after the placement. So those those were the biggest challenges. Um, and then the mental challenges of, OK, am I going to be a good dad? Am I making a mistake? Am I, you know, am I going to really be what this child needs me to be? Um, am I going to be able to manage whatever challenges comes by way of behaviors? Those those were the mental challenges that I faced, just not wanting to go into this and and, and feeling like a failure um, after, after some time. So those were just some of the challenges. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you just you mentioned about how, you know, you had to kind of develop a support system because, you know, like the saying always says, you know, it takes a village to raise a child and it and it truly does, you know, with adoption, not only supporting the child, but also some family, some family and some some people there to support you as well, because this is a brand new journey for you. Um, so it's great that you were able to build that support system there. Um, so you have kind of a, um, a more unique journey. Um, you started to uh, you started the process to adopt as um, a single dad. And I know that, you know, there are a lot of a lot of, you know, men who, you know, want to pursue adoption um, and who, you know, just like you want that family. Um, so, you know, as a single man who is going through this process, um, did you have any apprehensions or um, or I guess just how did how did you feel like going to the process as a single man? Um, you know, I had an interesting thing happen uh, in my first uh, series of, uh, of adoption classes. There were about twelve to fourteen people in my in that class, and only two of them were married couples. Everyone else were single dads. It was wow. and so when okay. I saw it, like wow, okay, so we we are representing, and so that was that was a big encouragement. That was a big motivational boost because, you know, it didn't leave me feeling like, okay, I'm in this room full of all these married couples wanting to adopt and here I am, the single guy, and everybody's looking at me funny. Um, it wasn't like that at all. Now, once you get past the class, um, there are some stereotypes you deal with, you know, you know, single men adopting kids. You know, there's a, there's a, a social and maybe even a cultural stereotype that, you know, number one, men don't take care of their kids, especially African-American men. Um, and that number two, why would a single guy want to adopt kids? And so those are some of the social and cultural uh, challenges um, that I faced in, in, in wanting to adopt as, as a single dad. But at the end of the day, when you're secure in who you are and you understand the motivations behind what you're doing and you have that support system that's going to be there to help you in, in, in the journey and in the process, um, at the end of the day, there are other single families, single dad families out there that are biological. And so to me, it was no difference whether it was a biological scenario or whether it was an adoption scenario. There are plenty of single dads out there doing a really good job raising their kids. And so I had to let the pros outweigh the cons and say, you know what, I'm a single dad. Mom, I was raised by a single mom for years and she did it with four kids. And then she turned around and did it again with three more kids that she adopted. And so that took a lot of the the mental, social, and cultural pressure off of me from the standpoint of this single single guy wanting to adopt kids. So I got past it and here we are today. Yeah, going showing and proving that there are, you know, wonderful dads out there. Um, single, single dads, married dads. So yeah, so what advice would you give, you know, a single man who's like saying, hey, this is something that, you know, I want to pursue as well. What, what advice would you give? Um, I, I would start off by saying, don't second guess yourself. Um, you know, ideally a two parent home is, is, you know, in the best interest of the child and, and all of the research says that's the best scenario for a child. Uh, but the reality is there are a lot of single parent homes out there that are doing a tremendous job. And as long as you've got a really good support system and you're aware of your own strengths and, and your own weaknesses, um, don't let it intimidate you. Don't let it uh, cause you to second guess yourself. You can do it. Uh, it's being done. It's being done all across the country. And so there's not a single reason that you can give yourself or anybody can give you why you can't adopt and be successful as a single dad. Hi, everyone. With 12,000 children in the foster care system, we are in need of safe, supportive and loving families for children more than ever. Today, we're going to bust five myths about children that are in foster care. Myth number one. You have to have a lot of money to foster. Fact, you don't have to have a lot of money to be a foster parent. We just wanna make sure that you and your family are financially stable. Myth number two, you have to be married to be a foster parent. Fact, 
foster parents can be married or single, male or female. Myth number three, when I foster a child, I'm on my own without any help. Fact, you are not alone as a foster parent. You have helpful agency staff here with CHS, as well as training to help prepare you for children coming into your home. Myth number four, I can't be a foster parent. I get too attached when they leave. Fact, the truth is, yes, as a foster parent, you may get attached, but you have the opportunity as a foster parent to make a lasting difference in a child's life, no matter how long or short you are in their lives. Myth number five, children in foster care aren't great kids. Fact, children in foster care are amazing kids. True, they have been through challenging, painful experiences, but with families like you who give them a loving, supportive environment, they can thrive. So now that you know the facts, I invite you to go to our website, chsnc.org slash foster to learn more about how you can be the difference in the life of a child. So yeah, so yeah, so you, you've adopted two boys. Um, what ages did you adopt your boys? Your, um, your uh, two boys that you adopted? The oldest one was 11 when he was placed, and I believe he was 12 when the adoption finalized. Uh, my second son was actually an interesting story because I had told the adoption agency, uh, I don't want a child over 13 years old. It's got to be 13 or under. And they called me and said, Mr. Brooks, uh, we had a child for you. And I'm like, okay, uh, how old is he? And he said, well, he just turned 14 this week. And I'm like, I told you 13 and under. Oh, Mr. Brooks, you've got to meet him. He just turned 14. You really got to meet him. And of course, I met him. And um, he was 14 when I met him. And he was still 14 uh, when we finalized. Uh, my current placement is actually 15. And he will be 16 uh, in June. The, the biggest misperception that I hear is that these kids are so, they're so troubled. They've got these major behavior issues. They've got these major uh, mental challenges. Just the, the worst of the worst is, is what's typically associated with these older, older kids. And the reality is, it's just not true. Now, yes, there are some scenarios where the, the challenges are more difficult than others. Um, and there's resources for that. You, it, it goes back to what I mentioned earlier. You have to know what you can handle and what you can't handle. And my experience with all three of my sons is that most of their behaviors were typical teenage behaviors. You know, they weren't any different than what I did when I was growing up as a teenager. And I, you know, I was a biological child. weren't any different than what I saw in the kids that I mentored or used passion over the years. Uh, a large part of the behaviors were, were typical, and for behaviors that were not typical, um, that's what the team is for. That's what the adoption agency is for. That's what the social worker is for. That's what your village is there for. We work together to uh, to understand the behaviors uh, or the needs behind the behaviors and, and we work to remedy them. But uh, the idea that these kids are, are, are you know wrecking machines and they're just, yeah, yeah, they've got some, if you have gone through some of the things that they've gone through and you experienced some of the trauma that they've experienced, you would understand why some of those behaviors existed, but the idea that they have to manage that they have behaviors that can't be managed or understood, or that they're far fetched from what a typical teenager does, that I simply haven't found that to be true. Yeah, and you know, it's one thing that you know really ran through my head as you speak is just you know, just kind of the need the need for em empathy. I think you know. Like you said, you know, given the traumas and behaviors that they've experienced, that's the reason why, you know, they, you know, exhibit certain behaviors. And so, yeah, you, we need families who, you know, are are willing to empathize with them. And like you said, you know, they're they have typical teenage behaviors and, you know, they they need love in a family, too. And I've heard so many great stories about, you know, how just the impact of having a great family, you know, you know did wonders for them. And so um, getting to more of the good stuff. So what were some of the rewards along the way? What did you, what do you, what do you, what did you find? What have you found the most rewarding about, you know, your adoption journey? Um, the biggest reward for me is um, mission accomplished. Uh, the goal was to provide a loving, stable, permanent home and family for a child that was in need. Um, mission accomplished um i can look back both of my, my my older sons they're out on their own they actually moved back to georgia um 
they're independent. They're, they've got their own children now. And to know that I was a factor and an ingredient in what they have today, what they're doing today, um, not just in their independence, but in supporting themselves and now supporting the family, I, you know, I don't know if it gets any better than that. And then to know that I have the opportunity to do it again with, with my current placement, um, that's that. I mean, that's a reward in itself. I don't. I don't know if the, you know. I, I never got into it looking for a a black or a father of the year nomination. Um, I was simply trying to do um, what I thought was the right thing, the desired thing, and even the biblical thing to do, and that is to take what I have that I'm consuming all by myself and 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 open a door and let someone else become a permanent part of it for their benefit. Um, because at the end of the day, for me. It's always about the child. There's always going to be that parental reward. Uh, when you get to see your children go off uh, on their own and, and be independent and be successful. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about making life a success for that child. And so I've had the opportunity to do that twice. I'm going to get to do it a third time. That's that's the biggest reward I can I, I can ever want, and and that's really all I need. Yeah, yeah, rewarding rewarding both ways. I mean, you're able to, you know, see. Your, see your teen, your children progress and I think that's kind of why a lot of families want the younger children because they feel like well then I'll get to like be a part of you know their progress and you know see them make those milestones but as you've seen there's there's still milestones to make even you know oh. at you know been in 14 years old so you're able to witness that and the best part about it is they've got a dad to to lean on and to come to for advice and you know, and for love. So that's wonderful. Are you interested in becoming a foster or adoptive parent? Our website, chsnc.org slash foster is the place to begin your journey to grow your family. Find answers to frequently asked questions about foster care and adoption. Still have questions? RCP for an information meeting to learn more about our agency, the licensing process, and answer any questions that you have. Ready to get started? Click the Get Started button to take the first step and complete an application. The first step is always the hardest, and and, and that is making the commitment to start the process. Um, for me, I went back and forth for almost two years uh, with my current placement because I had the empty nest. Uh, because again, my, both my older boys are grown and out the house. I had the empty nest, and for me, it wasn't about the empty nest. It was about feeling that itch to adopt again. I want to be a dad again. I want to born to a child. And I went back and forth for about two years. I actually started the process um, and went about four weeks into it, and I contacted the CHS and said, you know what? I don't think I'm ready. Let's put this on hold. And what happened was almost two years later, I saw a an adoption video, and it was a video of an older, uh, older teen being adopted by a, a two-parent home. And it was the most, I mean, it was a tearjerker. It was like, you know what? I don't know who was responsible for this, but you are wrong for doing this because you just pushed the button in my heart that made me say, okay, you know what? I need to I need to pursue this process and, and, and go forward. So um, that's the biggest step. Uh, and once you get past that, for me, everything else is downhill. You already have the desire to do it. You know it's there. Um, you've got questions, you've got concerns, you've got some apprehensions, you may even have some fears. Um, none of those will ever get addressed until you make that first step of, of committing to the process and everything after that will fall into place. It really will. That's right. That's right. Um, so as far as working with CHS, what have you appreciated the most about, about working with us? Uh, the support system has been incredible it, it it really has um the training was yeah i've been to two different trainings for for, for, for adoption and this one was by far the most i feel like this one it equipped me beyond what i thought i could be equipped for, for for parenting because it really honed in on understanding the unmet needs of a child based on the behaviors that they exhibit and and if if you don't get that, then you can find yourself really frustrated and aggravated and wanting to give up on the process because all you'll see is a misbehaving child, but you don't understand what the unmet needs are that's driving the behavior. And if you can, if you can identify what that unmet need is, you can alter and fix the behavior. Um, 
so the training was incredible, especially since COVID hit um, and everything had to be uh, retooled for, for, for training and the process because all the face-to-face stuff had to come to a halt. And so everything went virtual, paperwork went virtual. There was a lot of adjusting that had to be done. And CHS just really didn't miss a beat. I was I was genuinely concerned that the, pro- that the process was going to be unbearably delayed because of COVID and the changes with everything going virtual. That simply wasn't the case. CHS had a plan, they put the plan in motion and they kept the process moving smoothly. And I I can't appreciate that enough. Um, That the folks I've worked with have been uh, responsive, my licensing worker, my adoption specialist, supervisors, um, they've all been just really, really great to work with. And if I've got a question, if I've got a situation, if I have a need, uh, they're there and they're responsive. And so it's, it's been probably the best working experience I've had uh, in the adoption process um, since the very beginning. Wow. Well, great. It's glad, I'm glad that we're able to, you know, support you and your family and on your pursuit to adoption, uh, to adopting um, a, teenage, a teenager, hopefully very, very soon. Um, so anything else that you want to share with um, prospective families who are um, considering this process? Any shout outs that you want to give before we wrap up? <laughs> Yeah, um, I'll, I'll give a, a, a thought and then some shout outs. Uh, the first thought is the, the thought is this, um, be open and be flexible. Um, know what you're looking for in, in, a, in a prospective child or children, um, but be flexible in, 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 in that desire. And I say that because the child I have now is not what I asked for. Um, I, I, I was clear in uh, what, what kind of child I want to place in my home. I actually wanted siblings. I didn't want a single child. I wanted siblings. Um, and uh, I had some other requirements in there. And the child that is placed uh, met none of them. Um, but I credit CHS, my, my, my previous adoption specialist. She called me. She said, you know, Phil, um, I know this is what you specified in your, in, in your home study, but I've got this profile over here. And, you know, I really like you to consider it. And after reading the profile a couple of times, I was like, you know what? I, I just, for some reason, it's not what I asked for. It's not what I wanted, but I feel like this is my child. Um, I needed to be flexible. I, I needed to say, you know what? I know what you wanted, but this looks real promising and you should probably consider it. So be flexible um, in, in, in what you're willing to, to uh, receive into your home and what you're willing to, to foster and adopt um, because you, it could make the difference between a child being placed and finding permanency versus staying in the system until they age out, which is obviously not what we want. Um, shout out, big shout out to Michelle Marble, my licensing specialist. I mean, she just rocks. She is like on a scale of one to 10, she's like a 50. Um, my current, um, adoption specialist, uh, Alicia Barringer and her supervisor, Tanil, uh, man, when I say they, they, these guys have got it going on, they have got it going on. They have been with me every step of this process. Uh, Tanil was actually involved in the, uh, the, the classes, the, the training classes. And just, you know, if I had a question, it was going to Tanil because she was just like, you know what, uh, you know, she, she, she got it going on. She knows what she's doing. Um, all right. All right. Well, I'm glad that I'm glad that you feel supported by CHS and thank you so much, Philip, by sharing your story. I mean, everything that you, you know, mentioned about, you know, families being flexible with preferences, um, families, um, you know, just 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 being open minded and just knowing that, you know, what they have in mind, it may not be who needs them and who, you know, is really supposed to be a part of their family. So I, I thank you so much for sharing your story and um, I'm I'm grateful that I'm grateful that those boys have you to lean on as, as, as their dad. On that note, if you are currently interested in pursuing adoption, um, I do encourage you to continue to ask, ask questions down there in the chat um, to our recruiters. We are waiting there live um, to answer any questions that you have about CHS, about fostering, about adopting. Um, if you are ready to take that first step, just like Philip took the first step, make sure you go to chsnc.org slash apply. Um, and we'll be there to help you along the journey, just like we were there to help Philip. Um, thank you again, Philip, for joining me. I know it was a long road to get you here, but I am so, so grateful that you, you know, decided to, to join and to talk with me today. This was so great. Um, and thank you all for tuning in to Family Talks. We'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.